Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. So this is another story from the Paladin DM that also goes by Lord Althory. If you like his work you should check out his subscribe star to support him directly or check out his YouTube channel linked to down below. And with that out of the way let's get into the story. Be me, the bard. Be Zaratustra, enraged lord of the Iron Circle, and his foe, Elatum, grandson of Lolth and an ancient and mighty demon in his own right. The two titans circled one another like stalking beasts, Zaratustra boiling over with rage, and Elatum wearing a confident smirk. The drow opened the fight, throwing out his hand to unleash a torrent of lightning towards the pit fiend. His smirk faded when the fiend appeared next to him. He swung his halberd to intercept the coming mace, and the two weapons met with such force that the resulting shockwave blew the plaza clear of dust. Elatham pulled back as Zaratustra tore chunks from his shoulder with a rip of his claw, and moved his halberd up to hold the larger devil back from biting his face off. The wound on the shoulder did not bleed, but revealed the Lakeham's interior. Devoid of bones, tissues, or organs, he was nothing but a ball of yellow sludge under his facade of skin. Zaratustra's tail lashed out and tore the Akol in half at the waist, causing him to grunt in pain. Still, he regenerated faster than he could fall and managed to slip back from the devil. That time stop is a remarkably irritating ability. He said, no longer smirking. His purple eyes lit up with a killer's glare, and he moved in again. His body expanded and arms elongated, striking at Zaratustra like a coiled viper. His speed and range caught the devil off guard, and he sustained a wound to his shoulder. Still, he did not falter. Zaratustra seized the halberd in one claw, wrapped his tail around it, and yanked, throwing Elatum off balance and towards him. The drow shifted again as he rolled, turning into a giant hedgehog with spears for spines. Zaratustra stepped forwards and swung his mace underhand, golf clubbing the monster into the sky. Elatum spun, the blow deforming his body like putty, and shifted again. He stabilized in a new form of a spherical monster, with a mouth filled with fangs, a single large eye, and many tendrils each toked with a smaller eye. Zaratustra dove to the side as the beholder opened fire, blasting a crater into the ground where the devil was standing mere moments before. Zaratustra seized a nearby slab of what had been the gateway and hurled it at the beholder. Elatum turned to disintegrate it, but Zaratara beat him to the punch. Immediately after hurling the masonry, the devil fired a fireball after it. The stone exploded in smoke and ash, blinding the many-eyed monster. Before Elatum could recover, the pit fiend was upon him. A claw tore the disintegration eye stalk from the beholder's body as the mace hit it squarely in its central eye, blinding it. Zaratustra seized the demon in his powerful jaws and hurled it down with enough force to force Elatum back into his true form. The drow hit the ground and prattered. Moments later, Zaratustra landed on him, crushing Elatum's skull in beneath his foot. The drow's face reformed on his chest, laughing as it seeped into the cracks between the stones and then the ground flipped up. Zaratustra flew backwards as a storm giant erupted from below him. Elatum swung his halberd with a single massive hand, throwing the devil down and back with another long cut. He raised his other blue hand and conjured the lightning bolt into it, hurling it at the devil. With his time stop still recharging, Zaratustra had no choice but to stand and take it. He covered his body with his wings and gritted his teeth as the blast left a scorch mark across them and drove him back, his feet digging trenches into the earth. Confidence restored, Elate halted the giant's face to resemble his own, grinning sadistically as he stalked forwards. I don't understand the point of all this. You can't beat me, and if you think your daughter's going to forgive you just because you tried you're an idiot. He mocked the wounded devil as his form changed again. Legs became tarnished silver trunks ending in sharp talons, he leaned forwards, neck elongating as crumpled wings stretched from his back and his body grew ever larger. His new scales were blood-stained and withered by magic, one eye was missing, and it had a great wound in its breast. 
Why he took the form of a dying ancient silver dragon, Zarathustra did not know. I brought down something as close to a god as any mortal will ever see. You are nothing but another gnat to crush under my boot. The elate hung dragon taunted as it soared over the scorched devil and unleashed a torrent of frost breath. Zarathustra stood his ground and answered the frost with a fireball. The two forces met in an explosion of steam that shrouded the whole battlefield in mist. Out of the mist the dragon tore down to rip the devil apart with fang and claw, as Zarathustra vanished again. The dragon felt itself pulled up by a wing as the devil re-emerged on its back, ripping into the more vulnerable wings. Then Zarathustra took his mace in both hands and brought it down. Thunder roared across the battlefield as the devil broke the dragon's back. You should have chosen a healthier form. He shouted back at Elatum as they both began to fall. He was caught off guard as he was struck in the face with an exact copy of his own mace. The two spun in the air, and he caught the halberd as it nearly drove through his throat. He snapped his head forward, and hit his copy in the face with a headbutt. The demon wearing his form simply laughed, healthy enough for him. It asked with his voice. The devil and his copy spiraled back down onto the plaza with the laughter of a madman echoing across the plaza. The two went back and forth, mason claw against copy and halberd. They moved in a blur, their movement so swift, the impact of each parry so powerful, the mist they had created was sucked up and blown away around them. Elatum was fast, strong, and his regeneration, while not perfect, meant he was in far better shape than his opponent. He wasn't any more than a novice in hand-to-hand -hand combat when compared to the thousands of years of melee experience Zarathustra had to bring. He had wasted too much of his magic toying with the paladins, and his most powerful sorcery had to be burnt to stop Julian's lightning. Still, he had a few tricks, and so he fainted with the mace, swinging it short, then turning it into a cascade of electricity. Zarathustra staggered back under the barrage, and then his eyes went wide as the lightning turned solid and stabbed him. He was lifted up in the air as Elatum expanded. His body was wreathed in fire, two horns sprouted from his head, and mighty wings of shadow and flame sprung from his back. The ball rogue cast Zarathustra away, and then cast its whip after him. The flames could not burn him, but they could drag him back towards the lightning blade. The blade came down, and Zarathustra blocked it, but even blocking could not insulate him from the electricity. The devil wanted to howl, but refused to give his opponent the satisfaction. The whole demon flowed down the blade, and Elatum re-emerged in his true form to drive his halberd into the devil's chest. Zarathustra fell. He toppled backwards, mace falling from his talon, turning to ash before it hit the stone. Each or fountain from the mortal wound up and around the halberd, as his torso also turned an ashen grey. Got you. Elatum gasped with a grin. With what he had left, Zarathustra reached up and seized the demon by the face in a talon. See you in Avernius. He cursed him, and then exploded, painting the remnants of the plaza in hellfire and bits of Elatum. Elatum still stood in the center though. He now resembled a drow Swiss cheese, but he was still alive. With concentrated effort, he drew the bits of himself currently raining down on the plaza back together. Then, he collapsed, flat on his back. Everything hurt. That had been far, far too close for comfort. Shifting that much was exhausting, and without his strongest magic, he'd been running on fumes. When will I learn to stop playing with my food? He wondered aloud, and then slipped into a dreamless sleep. The paladins re-emerged in front of the hobgoblin army in a flash of sulfur and brimstone. The hobgoblins took one look at them and turned very, very pale. Julian and Andre, the only ones still conscious and alive after the disastrous encounter with the late Tom, looked like they just stepped out of hell. Get stretchers, and make all speed for the abbey, we stop for nothing understand me? Nothing, Julian barked orders. The paladins, including Senkit, were loaded onto improvised transports and carried with them. Andre, still in a state of shock, was also loaded onto a stretcher. For the next two days and nights they traveled without sleep or rest, Julian and his flaming sword led the way. When they finally arrived again at the abbey, they were ragged and weary. Julian looked haggard, 
his face drawn and skeletal, his stride slouching, practically leaning on Andre and Bast for support. Andre was quiet and withdrawn. The rest of the paladins were stable, but still unconscious due to a lack of time for proper bed rest. The sentries took one look at them and were immediately skeptical. Julian raised his head and ordered the gate open. Even beaten and exhausted, his glare was more than enough to make the guard not ask any questions. The army marched inside, and a great cry went up from the abbey when they saw their champions laid low. Kasdor, Eort, and Peregrine were taken to the infirmary immediately, and sank it to the room Julian had set aside to conducting his experiments. Several stared at Bast and wondered what she was, though her disguise as merely a particularly hairy Debraxi held. Other sentries looked to the north from whence the paladins had come. It was already a grey day, but the clouds in the north were unnatural colours. Several men swore they could see shapes moving in them, shadows in the indigo lightning. Thunder rolled over the abbey like distant laughter. Then it began to rain. Julian limped into the room where Snake's body lay, covered by a shroud. He reached for his ritual book, but his muscles spasmed and he dropped it, almost falling and having to steady himself. He reached for it, but slender fingers picked it up before he could. Julian turned and saw Andre there holding it. Give me that, he said, his voice barely a whisper. I have to fix this. I have to make it right, he said dully. His eyes were red, his face sorrowful. You need to rest. The spell will still work tomorrow, but if you try it now you can bungle it. Andre warned, but still he reached for it. Have to fix it. Have to make it right. My fault. My fault. He said, and Andre took his hand gently. No, there was nothing more you could have done. She told him. Too slow. My fault. Have to fix it. Have to make it right. Julian repeated like a mantra. Sleep. Andre commanded him, her word imbued with power. Julian struggled, but his exhausted mind and body could not resist. He closed his eyes and fell forwards into Andre's arms. She brought him to the infirmary and maintained a vigil there. Fear began to spread through the abbey like a cancer. Many came to Andre, and she told them what had occurred. Many demanded a plan, others fainted outright and had to be added to the bed. The knowledge that their champions had not only lost, but had been utterly beaten, shook them to their core. No news more than the reality. Their abbess was dead. It was a full day before the paladins regained consciousness. During that time, the council kept the peace, and many came, paying their respects to their dead abbess. Grom Badle personally enacted a spell to keep her body from decaying, but he did not know that Julian had copied down the spell of resurrection. When they regained consciousness, they immediately went to Senkit's body. Upon seeing it, Kazdor turned away weeping, unable to look at her. He went away from the room as Julian set to work. Senkit found herself looking up at a beautiful blue sky, on a warm, prescient day. Her armor and weapons were gone, and she was clad in a simple white robe, with a crown of gold and ruby on her head. She was lying in tall, green grass on the side of a hill. Out before her stretched a silver sea, and behind her rose seven tall mountains. She did not know how she had come to be here, and did not know where this place was. She turned as she heard the sound of footsteps approaching. A man was coming, with dark skin and hair, yet merry eyes. He was tall and broad, the figure of one who has spent a lifetime fighting on the road. He wore the same robe and crown as she did. He appeared to be in his prime, far younger than when she had seen him last, but she knew his face. Master Arvidor, she said, almost unbelieving. Here at last she had found her mentor, after so many long years. She ran to him and embraced him, and he embraced her. Hello again Firebrand, he said kindly. But he how? I was fighting the Dark Elf and then. Oh no. She sank to her knees, horrified as memory of what she had seen washed over her. All the joy of seeing her mentor went out in an instant as she remembered what had become of. Zariel? I know. I know. She was the one who killed me after all. He said, trying to comfort his student, almost joking. Killed you. Then this is. The Blessed Mountains, yes. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
He answered her, but she could not believe. How? I am a devil. Unworthy, and with a lifetime spent serving a devil. All I deserve is oblivion or hell. Oh, little one, Arvidor said sadly. Not by your blood, nor by the name of Zeriel are you judged righteous, for even when she was an angel she had no power to save. But instead by faith you were set free from the dominion of darkness, and earnestly you have chased after what is right and good. You are forgiven, and were given a spirit of light to empower you to accomplish all good works. But neither by these works, but by faith you have been made righteous. You were not conformed to the flesh you were given but were transformed by a Holy Spirit into a new creation. Zeriel has fallen, but you have been redeemed, and echo every aspect of the person she once was. Arvidor lifted up her face and helped her to her feet, embracing her once more. So well done, my beloved daughter. Your faith has set you free. The two stayed there a while, speaking of all that they had done. Arvidor had heard rumors of Zeriel's fall, and so had departed to seek the truth of it. He found it when he came upon her in the fields of Avernus, and the two battled. But, while Arvidor was indeed a mighty man of valor, he was no match for the Archduchess. His soul had escaped her clutches though, and come here to rest. The two began to walk together over the hill, and they came upon a golden city at the foot of the mountains, and the city had six gates, each decorated with fine gems. They began to go down to the city when Senkit stopped. She felt a tug at her, a call back. Julian had completed his ritual. Arvidor turned to her, knowing what had happened. Will you go back then? He asked her. Or have you finally come to your rest? Senkit looked at him with a slight smile. Teacher, you know what my answer is. If you go back, you will face a late time again. Arvidor warned her. I have nothing more to prove. Death holds no terror for me anymore. She answered him. Arvidor smiled. Well said Echo. Though while you're going, you shall not go back unaided. Senkit raised an eyebrow at that one. Cause Dor returned to his room and had begun to weep. Hot tears flowed down his face into his hands, which balled into fists. In his rage, he cast his axes into the wall, and then struck it with enough force that his fist cracked the stone. He then sagged over, sobbing. He was angrier than he had ever been before, but there was no fire, because he was more scared than he had ever been before. The woman he loved was dead, and part of him had died with her, although he knew it was never to be, even if she had lived. He had been unable to protect her, or his friends, and now a monster like nothing he had even dreamed of had appeared. He was terrified. There was a sound at the door as it opened. Thelin, or perhaps Atar, he thought, come to offer what Sukkot they could. He turned, and nearly fainted for joy. Before him stood a tiffling woman, as beautiful as she was the day he met her. She wore a crown of gold and ruby and was clad in brilliant pure white armor, marked with the signs of seven gods. On her arm, the shield she had lost had been replaced with one that shone like the light of dawn. At her side there was the same old plain morning star she had always used. Do not be afraid, Senkit told him. Death has no sting for us, she said, and the two embraced one another. The paladins had returned. The paladins were not done yet. Be me. Be the paladins. Senkit, Peregrine, Andri, Eort, Julian, and Gazdor. For almost a year now they have fought, bled, and more than once died to begin establishing a nation in the summer lands. Now elate them, the grandson of Lolf is come, and will sweep all of it away in the name of chaos. But order undivided shall not go without a fight. The party reassembles in Paladin's court to discuss the matter of Elatum. Despite the joy of Senkit's resurrection, they are all grim-faced indeed. They know they can't just beat him. The question now comes as to what they do in response to that. Information. Julian says. What do we know about Elatum? Andre, you were his apprentice, you know him better than anyone else here. Andre grimaces as she looks back on her memories. Well, you've encountered Fistan, how good he is with that halberd, and how powerful a midge he is. He's more than capable of casting at the ninth tier, and has more potential for spell storage than any mortal I've ever met. 
I know he can change his form, but I don't know the limits on that. In any case, he's pretty much impossible to hurt with ordinary weapons. Cut him, bash him, run him through and it won't matter. What about magic? Senkit asked. He clearly isn't completely invincible or he wouldn't have bothered blocking Julian's lightning. He's something similar to Yakol, so essentially a massive ball of goo. The only thing I ever saw seriously hurt him was a silver dragon's breath. It froze him solid and he didn't come back when it shattered. Andre mentions. I'll see what scrolls we have of cold spells. Julian responds. What about his psychology? What's the Skuna gonna do next? Kazdor asks. Do we need to evacuate the abbey and run for it or do we have time to reinforce? Evacuate the abbey. Valin says in horror, and Kazdor's look tells him that he's not being overly dramatic. No amount of reinforcement will help. Ninth tier magic will level the abbey. Julian says darkly. It's about as well fortified as any castle I've seen, but it won't stand up to spells like Earthquake or Meteor Swarm. Pretty much the only things that could hold up to that would be a Dwarven stronghold, and we don't have one of those just lying around. That's me entirely true. Kazdor mentioned. We do ken where Draken feasting is, and that's a proper hold. Even assuming we can find and take that place, do we have enough men to hold it? Senkit asks. I've got every nightmare in my legion out sweeping the country for any stragglers and minor war hosts. Eort says with his arms crossed. If we can rally my people together, I suspect we could have as many as 5,000 veteran warriors drawn together. Aye. And we've also recently received word from the south while you were away. Valin mentioned. There's a large migration of clanless dwarves heading towards the northern ports. Muradin sends his aid. Senkit said with a grin. Aye, the omens are clearly set for us to retake Drake in Feastin. What about the Eladrine? Can we count on them for aid? Andri shakes her head. Elaytum will hit over Karen first. They'll have problems of their own to deal with. I still don't see how one man, no matter how powerful, could take a city by himself. Senkit pondered. He won't be by himself. He's half demon and can call on some rather notably sized hordes of them. Andri informed her. I'm not sure how many he called when he destroyed my home, but it was an entire army. That shouldn't be possible. Julian considered. There's a limit on how many creatures any midge, no matter how powerful can call forth. One man can't summon an entire army, and certainly not use any other magic while doing that. He isn't a man, he's a demigod. Andri responded. He's about as close to invincible as it gets. Even full on gods and invinviable. Julian said. I need to call in a few favors. Bast. Go get Marie. He asked the devil, who rose and walked out. We need to talk about her. Peregrine said warily once she was gone. And the nightmares, and how exactly we all survived and were miraculously teleported away. You wouldn't believe it was divine intervention? Oh, ye of little faith. Julian said, falling back on sarcasm for a defense. Jules I'm not trying to condemn you, I'm worried for you. You're dabbling with forces that air beyond your comprehension, not mine. I grew up working with fiends, you aren't going to scare me off of working with such powerful allies. And if you're concerned for my soul, you seem to forget I don't pay the gods any lip service, so I doubt they'll take me anyways. Julian responded, his voice tinged with anger. It's a fair question. Senkit said. How did we get away, because you know, your father intervened. Julian told her, and she was taken aback. Your death called him forth. It wasn't entirely a lie, but wasn't entirely the truth either. I agreed to resurrect you in exchange for him teleporting us away. That seems a wee bit cheap for a devil. Kazdor said with a disbelieving tone. What price would you put on the life of your child? I'm well aware that you hate him Sen, but he does genuinely love you. At the very least he's as close to love as a devil can get. Julian responded, quite literally acting as devil's advocate. Or at least it's the only time I've seen one about to break down crying. Senkit and Julian glared daggers at one another for a long moment, 
Andre watched them both and came to a certain realization. This wasn't simply an argument about whether Julian had done something unholy. It wouldn't have been the first time. It was a fight between their two ideologies. Senki could only, would only, see devils as absolutely evil. Julian on the other hand saw them as useful and rejected the ideas of morality altogether. Neither one would back down. Andre coughed. We can argue when we don't have a mad demigod coming to kill us all. She said, cutting the glares off. Marie entered shortly thereafter and bowed. Julian called her over and handed her a scroll. Do you recognize this? He asked his apprentice. She frowned. It's a permanent summoning spell, how did you get this? I made it, it summons one particular outsider, namely me. Julian said, drawing confused stares from the rest of the council and party. In case you forgot I'm not from this plane, remember? Why exactly do we need to summon you? Senkit asked suspiciously. Because I'm taking the quickest route back to Sigil to contact some old friends and see if I can't call in a few favors to give us an edge against Elatum. Wait, how do ye plan on getting to a whole other plane no existence? Cause Dor asked, still confused. Julian smiled and opened the hidden door into the catacombs, pointing at the glyph painted into the floor. I plan on using that to banish myself. Grins spread across the party as they realized his plan. Bast came alongside him. Marie, summon me back in about, say, 24 hours. That ought to give me enough time. The rest of you, get to work on getting this place ready to go. I'll be back, he said, and before anyone could stop him, he stepped on the glyph and vanished. He reappeared in a puff of smoke back to a comfortingly familiar hustle, bustle, and noise. The sound of thousands of creatures from all across the plains moving and talking. The smells of Athosian spices, Eberonium steel, Arcosian fabrics told him he was in the bazaar section even more than the colorful tents. He smiled. Spreading his wings he flew upwards, past many levels of shopping creatures until he felt gravity reverse, and he fell upwards onto the reverse side of one of the many walkways going throughout the city. He called Bast to his side and she joined them, the two walking down the road together. It's good to be home. Julian said with a nostalgic sort of longing. He looked around. From here he could see the whole of the bazaar spread out below him. They were on the outer edge of the habitation terrace that made up the city of doors. He looked outwards towards the countless portals that ringed the city's edge, actually managing to spot the one he took to his current home. Agreed and be somewhere climate controlled, Bast said with a rumbling purr. You couldn't have picked a world that was a bit more advanced than the feudal age. We'd hardly be able to accomplish anything if we did, Julian said, his footsteps echoing off the stainless steel walkway. A fair enough point. Still, I didn't realize how much I missed air conditioning. Bast purred as she stretched out, or being able to walk upright, though I suppose that cat's out of the bag. I didn't take you for one of the puns. Julian said as they turned down a set of side roads, he leapt off and gravity reverted again, landing him upright as he stepped into a series of tunnels snaking through and between the densely backed houses and shops. He could hear the sounds of arguing nearby. He didn't know what they were saying, but he recognized the Jianki tongue and altered his course. After about two hours of walking, which was slightly longer than it needed to be but several of the shortcuts and back paths he had once known were now gone, or went entirely different places. They arrived. Isn't he off plane? Bast asked his Julian knocked on the door. If sends anything like her master, he wound up back here rather quickly. The door opened, and Julian and Bast were met with the sight of a large fox-like humanoid. He had golden brown fur, two indigo eyes hidden behind golden spectacles, and was wearing long blue robes. He also, as Julian had always known him, had a tome under his arm. It was never the same tome, and it was occasionally just a book or scroll, he'd even seen a clay tablet once, but the Arcananath was always reading something. Hello librarian, Julian said with a smile. Jules my boy, I thought you were dead. Come in come in. The Akonalath responded, waving Julian and Bast in. 
His eyes lit up like a grandparent seeing their grandchild for the first time in a long while, or a tutor reuniting with a favorite pupil. Julian and Bass stepped in. Like most houses in Sigil, the librarian's home was larger on the inside than on the outside. What from the outside seemed a drab and unpleasant residence of concrete slabs was in fact a spacious, warm, and yet slightly cozy home. Comey block architecture notwithstanding, the interior of the home was lined with mahogany walls, a thick shag carpet, and of course bookshelves upon bookshelves. It hard to find a place not packed near to bursting with scrolls, tomes, and tablets. The Arcanalith ushered the pair to a series of leather comfort near a roaring fireplace, the mantle of which held even more books. The librarian returned quickly with a fine tea set and poured out three cups from a black china set. The trio drank together. The tea was an excellent spiced chai that warmed heart and soul. So, how did you know I was even back? The librarian asked curiously. I'm working with Arvidor's squire. Julian said, and the librarian started at first, then chuckled. Well, then you're in strong company if nothing else. He and his party gave me quite the fight. Shame, I wish I had more time in that particular center of learning, alas. Well give it a while and I might have another library for you to manage. That ain't possibly a position at a university. A university? My boy you're doing remarkably well for yourself. You must tell me what you have been up to. And so Julian related to him all that had occurred in the five years between when he had departed Sigil and now. He told him of the abbey, of the ruined city, of his battle with the Alhoun, the heroism of his friends, and the rebellion of the Hobgoblins. He told him of Elatum. That's part of the reason I'm here, albeit temporarily. I need whatever information you have on this creature. Julian said. The librarian frowned, and steepled his fingers. From what you tell me he's a fairly young demigod, and that sort of information doesn't come cheaply. A job and full access to a new library of magical knowledge isn't enough. Oh it's good to be certain, but that investment is several years in the making. I require an advance. You are one of my favorite students, but that discount only goes so far. Fair enough, what if I told you I also happen to be carrying a spell of the seventh tier with me? One obscure enough that I doubt you know it. Magic from a race that rarely produces it. Julian countered, and smiled as he saw the librarian's ears perk up. Would that do for an advance? Perhaps, but first let me see it. The information first, then we talk. I'm not stupid enough to backstab you librarian. Julian countered. Arsima and Fiend smiled at one another. It was a game they had played many times, the art of the barter you cloth so enjoyed. They haggled around for a bit, arguing more for the joy of arguing than anything else as they polished off the tea. Eventually, they settled on the deal that Julian had led with. It was a good deal, and one the librarian was willing to accept, but the sons of Jhinnabata, because it is in their blood. He handed Julian a small tome, which he began to read. What he found concerned him greatly. There was little known about Elatum, for he was a young demigod indeed. A few things were known. He was a masterful midgen warrior, a peerless shapeshifter, and worst of all, a walking rift in the world. His mere presence allowed demons to swarm around him as though they walked the abyss, and when he unleashed his power fully, the world bent and twisted around him. He was an incarnation and herald of chaos come to destroy the world. Julian studied it and found a small sliver of hope. He was still partly an elf, and still partly under the dominion of the elven gods. That might be just the angle he needed to stop him. He shut the book and pocketed it away. And as for my spell? The librarian asked, tail swishing slightly. Julian grinned. By the time he had departed, he was richer in knowledge of his foe. As for the librarian, he had a new job to look forwards to, and also a new spell to add to his books. Unlimited bread works. I am the bard, the watcher of many worlds. Of Kazdor Glamdring, Senkitzaratustra, Andre Silverthorn, Julian Tiran, Aort Princeps, and Peregrine Horse Rider. During Julian's 24-hour vacation to Sigil to obtain more information on how to defeat Elatum, the rest of the paladins set to work. 
Faced with the incredible power of Elaine's magic, they know that they have only one real choice. They must evacuate the Abbey. Senkit informs the inhabitants, to great dismay. Elven, Dvarvan, Human, and Halfling colonists are reluctant to depart so relatively soon after arriving. Families have just begun to settle down, some are pregnant, the first harvest was just taken in. Now they must flee again into the west. The goblins, kobolds, and halfling natives are somewhat more willing to depart the abbey. Unlike the relatively new colonists, they are painfully aware of how harsh the lands can be. They do not know Elaytum, but many of them have witnessed the power of the paladin's fist and they saw their beaten forms, they saw Senkit's corpse. They know a storm is coming and not even the Abbey will be able to stand against it. The Alpha Legion is least concerned of any of the group. They are hardened warriors one and all. They have spent much of their lives on the move from defensive position to defensive position. They are somewhat reluctant to abandon as strong a position as the Abbey could be, but they have heard legends of the impregnability of Dwarven strongholds. They will follow their legate. They did not know how long they have before the blow falls, and so prepare to move out at once. Fortunately, the rainstorms that blanketed the land for the past week have finally abated. The roads are muddy, but dry quickly in the summer sun. It will be no more than a few days before they are able to move again. Andri and those elves who are able leave the abbey first. They travel out into the west under her leadership. With her coordination, they quickly begin expanding and completing their maps of the area. They stay relatively close to the abbey but travel hard. They move in pairs, stopping only to rest. Their speed and woodcraft lend themselves to the work well, and the map hung in the war room quickly triples in scope and detail. Eort coordinates the planning and logistics of the evacuation, working with Robert, Julian's aide as well as the other council members to determine the best paths and plans for moving so many. They also conduct a census, to know how many wagons, how much food, how much defense is going to be needed. The abbey has expanded a great deal in the months they've spent there, and the old figures are no longer quite accurate. The results of the census are as follows. There are 213 humans, 123 of which are considered able to be capable or trainable to fight. There are 131 Dwarves, of which 110 are capable of defending themselves. There are 99 Elves, all of fighting age and ability. There are 152 Halflings, of which 70 are able to serve as warriors. The Goblins number 302, of which 200 are able to fight, though less than willing. There are 240 Kobolds, all of which are able to fight, though few are trained. However, they also carry with them 103 eggs that are to hatch in the next few months. Finally, the Hobgoblins numbered 1,759 bloodied warriors. Therefore, the total numbers of the Ordanic Union were 2,896, of which 2,592 could potentially fight if trained into a militia, but of those no more than two, 091 would actually have any serious prior training and experience. The reports suggested that perhaps 2,000 dwarves might join them, and there were perhaps 10,000 hobgoblins still scattered out across the land, but neither force could be guaranteed to reinforce them. Even still, the Outriders set forth to deliver messages to them, to come and join the new Union and ensure the triumph of order over chaos. This knowledge galvanized the effort substantially. The dwarves, led by Kazdor, worked around the clock to prepare wagons, repair equipment, and most of all, create as many weapons as they possibly could. The problem was a lack of metal. There was nowhere near enough to give the army even spears, let alone armor or swords. This could be solved if Draken feasting could be captured, for it would surely hold great stores of weapons and armor, and also veins of iron and perhaps even mitral to be used for more forging. In the meantime, it would have to be quarterstaffs. The hobgoblins proved to be a magnificent labor corps to assist in gathering the material, creating basic staves and shields for the colonists to defend themselves, and also beginning to train the militia. The trees fell around the abbey at an astonishing rate, clearing much new room for farmland. That is, assuming they ever came back.
On the topic of food, Peregrine took over that responsibility. Fortunately, the first harvest was just taken in. They had also expected the arrival of the hobgoblins, so foraging, fishing, and hunting operations were already expanding to draw in the bounty of the land. The food is brought in and turned into more preservable forms. However, they soon realize they do not have enough salt to preserve all of their meat. They resolve this by constructing a large smoking tent and simply smoking everything to ensure its preservation. Peregrine is secretly delighted at this, as it allows him to finally use all the various types of smoking techniques he's learned over the years. However, even smoking, boiling, and other means of preservation and purification cannot stop one particular disease, the blight. The natives will be fine, as they possess an immunity to it. They are born of this land, and the blight only strikes outsiders. The colonists have only survived this long because the consecrated land of the abbey destroys the blight, meaning all food taken in there is free of it. However, once they leave, they will be at risk from all newly gathered food. Therefore, they are given first priority of the food stores, and gathering will occur, but the colonists may not eat gathered food. Water on the other hand would be far less of a problem. It would have been confirmed that the blight could not travel in water, but had to infest other living things. The route would stay near to either the river that traveled under Spookfoot Bridge, which the halflings call Drumbledown, or the Great River which ran through San Jonas. The name of this river had been lost to time, and so it was called the Celestion, for the ancient god of travel. Lastly, Senkit herself travels all about the colonists as they work, resolving disputes, soothing raised tempers, and generally keeping morale up. She is constantly moving to help in one area or heal in another. For that, the abbess is much beloved. All these things were taking place or had taken place when the 24 hours were up and Julian returned, his face very grim indeed. He had learned of their foe, and what he had learned was not good. Still, he was quite impressed with how the organization of the evacuation was going. He made only one small change. The dwarves, halflings, goblins, and kobolds were all to train together, at least so many as that their total number would equal the number of hobgoblin heavy infantry. When asked why, he smiled, and told them. That plan would not be put into motion until after the conquest of Draken Feastin, and so I shall abstain from spoiling it. The next day, the paladins assembled to discuss their work. The preparations for the great exodus were going well. The food was being gathered up, the roads were drying, the wagons were being made ready. The training had only just begun, but the decanum in charge of it informed them that, while the militia was currently completely hopeless, they were progressing quickly. Despite all this good news, Julian's face remained grim. Ah, take it what ye found was knee good? as Dor asked his friend, his voice slightly concerned. Not good does not even begin to cover it. Julian said with a sigh. I'll start with the good news. It cost me favors, bargaining, and general boring paperwork worth more than I'd like to admit, but I tracked down the priest of Boktob who was willing to talk with me. I found Delateham's true name. That made the whole table sit up and take notice. The true name of a fiend gave you a certain degree of power over them. With it a fiend could be summoned, commanded, and even exorcised with a certain degree of certainty. It had its limits though, a creature as powerful as Elaictum wouldn't go down just to that, particularly not as he was an archmagi, and likely had taken precautions against just such an eventuality. Still, it might just give them a fighting chance. Julian still wasn't smiling though. However, we may not get a chance to use it, he said grimly. I know how he's going to get his army, and he's going to be bringing quite the army. Elaictum has inherited his grandmother's power of soul manipulation. He can transform the souls of everyone he kills straight into demons, right here on the mortal plane. Furthermore, he's a walking planar rift, a fragment of the abyss in the form of a man. As such, any demon bound to him has effectively infinite abyssal energy to draw on. They'll stick around forever, and he has no limit on how many he can summon. That news spread the grim look to everyone. 
With that kind of power, Elaitham was more than capable of creating an army more powerful than almost any on the plane, and constantly growing it with further slaughter. If it got out of hand, it could wreak untold havoc, not only wiping out the Union, but heading further south to bring devastation to the south. This was not just a threat to the Abbey or the colony. This was a threat to practically the entire North. How many? Eort asked. How many do you think he can rally before he hits us? Ashbury's allies. Peregrim suddenly said with horror. That's where he'll get the souls to form his army. And then he'll march on Elva Karen and burn it to the ground, Andre said darkly. A city that size might have 40, 50,000 people living there, assuming you count the slaves. That is a lot of potential demons, and we have no way of stopping him. I doubt the conversion is one to one. Julia noted. I'd say more along the lines of five to one if you want to create anything stronger than a dretch, and for something like a glebrezure, you'd need dozens, maybe even hundreds. He's also unlikely to create anything too powerful. He ought mentioned. Or else it might threaten him, so at least we won't have to fight a ball rogue. Even assuming a best case scenario that's an army of eight to ten thousand demons. Senkit muttered. Not good odds. Aye, but with a critical weakness. Kazdor noted. The schooner's the only thing keeping them here. Kill him, and the army goes poof. It might be an Achilles heel guarded by dragon scale and mitral plate bolts, but it's a heel alright. Senkit confirms. So, all we have to do is kill an Archmagi with incredible shape-shifting powers who beat all of us with Nria Care, who also happens to be basically immune to normal physical damage and is strong enough to beat Senkit in a one-on-one -on -one melee fight, Eort says. Piece of cake. He jokes sarcastically. Well, at least we make a habit of doing the impossible. Peregrine said with a bit of a grin. We're well practiced for now. Meanwhile, across the plains in the Fi Wild, Mittalk, in the guise of Elatum continued his work, surrounded by the glaring eyes of the various Fae captains that had come together. Ashbury's allies had been faithful indeed to come to her in her time of aid. Then again, alliances several centuries in the making tended to hold. That, and they also were rather afraid of what such a revolt might unleash. Ashbury was the largest holder of hobgoblin slaves in the region, always a calculated risk of course, but one that had paid dividends for her. Her family, once small and insignificant soon were rubbing shoulders with the best and brightest in Elva Karen. Such success bred imitators, and soon they had also begun to gather large slave populations. It was this shared trade that brought them together, to preserve their lands and also to ensure that should the slaves ever get any ideas, they would not succeed. Elaktum smiled as he worked, in spite of the elf lord's glares. He honestly had a great deal to thank them for. Without their greed and their sense of superiority, he would never have been able to infest the region so thoroughly. His smile faded as he thought of all the work he was about to undo. It was a shame that he had to waste such wonderful fetidity. It was all going to fall apart too soon anyways though, and may as well get some fun out of it while he can. Besides, he had to deal with these and create an army to deal with those paladins. He frowned as he thought of them. The demigod was far too proud to feel fear, but even his great ego couldn't ignore facts. They were strong. He'd beaten them, but he'd had to burn the best of his magic to do it. The dragon was mighty, the angel rather clever, the goblin and the halfling too good with those swords. Not to mention that devil, and Andri. She had always been his best student. If he didn't attack and utterly destroy them and everything they had built within the year, they would grow, and next time he might not win. Especially if they had a lord of the iron circle at their beck and call. He needed the army, just in case. Have to make sure with this one. He said as he finished the last of the runes on a fey gate. Have to make sure of what? One of the elf lords asked. Oh, you know, that this doesn't spit us out in the abyss or something. He said with a grin. He stood before the fey wild side of the fey Karen planar gate. The army had assembled before it, intending to march through. There was only one small problem. The gate was shut, 
mostly due to a certain gooey demigod getting put through its mortal side like a baseball though a screen door. He looked out at the army. It was rather impressive. 10,000 men and women, all finally trained warriors. So many souls to use. Shame they were all dead. It's done. Elatum said, dusting his hands off as he stepped back from the gate, which began to hum as it fired up. Elatum slipped into the ethereal plane, just to make sure he was out of the way when it opened. The gate opened into absolute darkness and stayed open for only a few seconds. That was all the time it had before the stones making it up turned to dust from the amount of negative energy released. In those few seconds, everything died. Every plant within three miles instantly withered. Those within a mile turned to dust. The air became dead, carbon monoxide. The birds fell out of the sky. The scurrying small animals turned to bones. Even the bacteria in the dirt died, and the earth became sand. The commanders of the army, those nearest to the gate, turned to dust. All 10,000 troops fell down dead in an instant. Then the gate to the negative energy plane collapsed shut. Elatham stepped out scowling at all the dead. It wasn't his preferred way of dealing with the army. He had the whole thing planned out with creeping doom and giant spiders where he would tear the whole thing apart piece by piece, gorging himself on the fear and terror. This was too clean, too merciful. Weapons of mass destruction killed too quickly to be fun. Still, needs must as he drives. He reached out his fingers and grasped the souls of the dead, those he could anyways. The count was lower than he had expected, of the 10,000, only around 8,000 had been dark enough for him to claim. Still, it was good enough. He could weave these into a decent enough army to take Elva Karen. And he could take his time there. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. I am the bard who has traveled many seas and seen many shores, and the heroes of many lands. Such as Kazdor the Crimson, Julian of the Astral Seas, Andre Silverthorn, Peregrine the Sojourner, Eort Princeps, and Senkit the Echo, Paladins of Order Undivided. They are now the last people remaining in Hearthfire Abbey. It has been one week since they returned and recovered from their defeat against Elaytham. In light of that shattering defeat, they have made extensive preparations to evacuate the abbey and make for the lost dwarven hold of Drake in Feastin. Eort and Peregrine walk the halls together, making sure nothing is left behind. Peregrine stops and runs off, picking up something. Eort walks over to investigate, and is somewhat confused to find a small stuffed lamp. What is that? Eort asks, somewhat curious. Oh, probably just some child's toy that got left behind. I'm sure they and their parents will be happy to see it. Peregrine says as he puts the toy in his bag. Eort looks at it curiously, as though he doesn't quite understand the point of it. Do halflings normally have things like this? I think most of the civilized races do. It's just something kids like, Peregrine says. Though I doubt you had that did you? The closest things I had to a toy was an old chess set my father gave me to teach me tactics. Eort said as they walked. My people's children don't play, we train. He sounds a bit regretful of that. Well, it certainly makes your people strong. Peregrine says as they keep walking. True, but there are times when I start to wonder why we need such strength. Our whole society is built around war and what has it gotten us? Ruins and hatred. Eort says with a sigh. What's the point of fighting if you're only fighting to get to the next fight? It never ends. He sounds tired, and a little sad. Of course, it's all down to serving the conqueror, but fat lot of good that's done. He remarks bitterly. What's brought this on? 
Peregrine asks curiously. The rebellion I suppose, and maybe just the past year here. He says as they walk into the great hall. He looks around at the wide expanse of now empty tables. He can still hear the friendly chatter, the happier days of feasting and life. Now all that may be behind them, and it scares him. You've built something worth fighting for here, not just something for fighting. He looks at the small toy. I want that for my people, a chance to make a country for ourselves, where our children can have something as silly and useless as a toy. I'd like to see a world where my son or daughter might be able to be something other than just another soldier to be thrown into the meat grinder. I've spent my whole life fighting. I think I'd like to try peace for once. Peregrine smiles and hops up onto a table so that he can put a hand on Eort's shoulder to encourage him. We'll make it. We'll beat this slimy bastard, come home to Heartfire for the greatest feast we've ever had, and take back San Jonas. We'll make that world for those who come after us, I'm certain of it. What makes you so certain? And don't say the gods will it because Julian doesn't have any and I've turned my back on mine. No, that's not it at all. Peregrine says. It's nothing to do with the gods, but something bigger. I've been around a long time, and heard a lot of stories, real and ones that I'm not certain that are real. This much I know, that while the world is dark and full of all manner of terrors and wickedness, good triumphs in the end. Things may not be as glorious as they're made out to be, and there will certainly be suffering, but good always triumphs. Gods or no, there's something at work greater than them. All the world's a story playing out, and the one writing it loves the characters. It will be a comedy when everything is done. Because all the threads that we thought were cut off in darkness shall come roaring out into golden light and weave together into something so magnificent that we cannot even imagine it. Sounds like quite a good story. Eort said with a smile. I certainly shall have to stick around to see the end of it. Outside, in the abbot's graveyard, Senkit stands over the last grave. She wonders if any of those who came before her also had to flee their abbey. She also wonders if there will be anything left for her to come back to. Will the first abbess of Hearthfire in so many years be its last? Senkit was afraid, and more than that afraid and uncertain of where to turn. Zeriel was gone, fallen. It was up to her now. The archangel's armor and shield hung heavy on her. She was the abbess, and the people would look up to her. She wasn't certain she could measure up. Ye are afraid ye you ready. Kaz Dor said as he stood beside her. She nodded. Good. He told her. She turned to him, somewhat confused. Nobody is ever ready to bear the mantle of responsibility. Nobody who deserves power thinks they are worthy of it, and no good leader goes a day without fearing they won't be good enough. Kaz told her, speaking in Dwarvish. If you think you've got it all figured out, if you think you're totally prepared, you're foolish and arrogant, or don't understand the responsibility. Nobody is perfect, and no one is truly able to sit on the throne perfectly. That's fine. The gods use imperfect people to make their plans done. There was never a flawless hero, never a perfect ruler. We all have our flaws, but we all also have our strengths. I've seen that shield arm hold up the weight of armies and dragons. You're strong enough to hold this. And whenever you're aunt, I've got two arms of my own to help you. The weight of the world is a heavy burden, but we don't have to bear it alone. Elsewhere, Julian and Andre set to work developing their best chance against Elatum. We have the name, but the exorcism will still need something to anchor it. Julian said as they studied the rough layouts of various glyphs and runes of binding and banishment. Any banishing force needs at least twice the power of the creature to cast it out, and probably even more for him. Binding then, but even then, that could be problematic. Perhaps the shards of the sort we found in Avernius's lair? Andri responded. Too antithetical. To enact a binding, we need something closer to the creature in question. Andri paused and looked hard at Julian. I know you've still got the branded equipment we took from Avernius. What are the limits of what you can do with that? Julian caught on what she was suggesting and shook his head. No. Nian. Yet. And I. I don't have anywhere near enough data on them to try something like that, 
and even if I did the application process is excruciating for even a small spell. Something like this would be an agony even hell shudders at. Andre's glare did not waver, her amethyst eyes practically boring a hole through Julian. Elate Tom has made me intimately familiar with agony in ways you cannot imagine and will do the same and worse to every single person in this nation if we don't stop him. Now answer my question. The caravan set out from the abbey, traveling first along the old road northwards until they reached Spildfoot Bridge, then west along the Rumble Down. It took them two days to reach the bridge, moving slowly and carefully. They slowed even further when they left the road and traveled alongside the river. All the while, the military trained, and the elven scouts swept out around, mapping all they found. They continued for another solid week before one day, the scouts came riding back with an unusual report. There were hoof marks, and the kind that normally only one creature produced, war pig. The camp quickly went on full alert. A giant boar the size of war pig could prove to be a very, very troublesome creature to deal with. Kazdor and the paladins began to ride at the head of the company so that they might be the first to hear about it and respond if the scouts found the beast. The next day, the scouts reported back, there wasn't just one giant boar, there were several, and they were moving in a group. This was highly unusual. Boars are surly and solitary creatures at the best of times. If there were several such creatures moving together, it was likely under the direction of an outside force. Defenses were tightened ever further. There was something else out in these hills, something intelligent and powerful. On the third day since the boar tracks were first spotted, which was the tenth day since leaving the road and the twelfth since leaving the abbey, a scout rode up to the paladins with a report. She had heard the sounds of boars moving in the forest ahead and found fresh tracks. The paladins rode out at all speed to try to catch and determine what exactly was going on. It took about an hour of riding before the party came into a clearing amid the forested hills. They could hear the boars moving about, and furthermore, they were coming closer. The wind blew their scent into the party, and war pig snorted. It was clear that whatever was in charge of these creatures had finally decided to reveal itself. It was not difficult to see them coming. They came in, a squadron of four of them, riding astride their own massive boars. The beasts wore special saddles and barding clearly made specifically for them, like war horses in the civilized south. On their backs rode tall figures, the shortest was six feet and two inches, and the tallest as tall as Kazdor. They were clad in full plate armor, but it was a very old style. The pieces were meticulously maintained, but they were some of the earliest forms of full plate to have ever been created. Their leader rode forwards from the group towards the center, and Warpig walked forwards to meet them. He, or maybe it was a she, impossible to tell with matte armor, carried a waved grey sword, a flamberge, on their back and held the reins of their mount with practiced ease. They sat up with a start when they saw the crest on Kazdor's chest, while they and their mount began to circle, Warpig moving with them. Kazdor and the unknown warrior studied each other carefully, sizing one another up as their mounts completed the full rotation, before coming to a stop in their original positions. At last, the warrior spoke, not in common, but in old Dwarvish, as though he were speaking it from hundreds of years ago. A devil clad in holy plate, an elven hobgoblin standing together, a dragon scaled hind with fangs for blades, and a human carrying a sword meant for a prince of the hells. Of these and you leading a caravan into our lands. He said as he reached up and removed his helmet. Kazdor's suspicions were confirmed, as a scaled face looked back at him. The dragonborn facing him was roughly the same size, but lighter of build, a little more agile and streamlined, but not nearly as bulky. If Kazdor were the raw physical bulk of a bear, this one seemed more like a shark. His scales were a gleaming gold, like the glittering coins of a horde given motion and form. His eyes were a deep sea green, and he had a series of long whiskers that gave him the impression of an east and moustache, but strangest of all, a crimson cousin comes, knowing a tongue that has almost been forgotten, and wearing a symbol that no living creature has worn in these lands for almost 500 years. Who are you? The gold dragonborn asked. I am Prince Kazdor Glamdring, third son and second living of Dutos Glamdring, king over the Shining Hold in the south, 
servant of Clangadin, avenging paladin of the Dramaze Gron. Strong arm of order undivided, Lord Commander of the Ordanic Union, Knight of the Ball by right of battle with the Earl King, Steward of Dragon Mountain by right of conquest, Midge Bane, Bearer of the Mantle of Dragon's Blood, Devil Breaker, and Dragon Slayer of Avernius the Red. Thus Kazdor answered him, using all his many names and titles, for he could perceive the man opposite him was a knight and noble in his own right. The knight answered him, I am Farron, Prince of the Road, son of Chief Anglazar the Wise, the fifth of my name, Slayer of the Undying, Breaker of Pirates, Slaver Hunter, Boar Master, Wielder of the Mitral Flame, Noel Bane, Banisher of Demons, Captain of the Ivory Sunset, Marshal of the Feroz Guard, Keeper of the Old Tongues, and Guardian of the Golden Coast in the Dragon Hills as far as the Great River to the North. The Lesser Daughter to the South, and the Ancient Highway, which are ours by ancient decree and treaty. Farron and Kostor descended from their mounts and approached each other, grasping gauntlets in a firm handshake. Well met, Kostor son of Dutos. He said, and likewise to your companions. Well met to you also, Farron son of Anglazar. Kazdor answered him, and likewise to your companions also. In the background, Eort nudged Senkit. So, are they friends now or are they going to start trying to kill each other? I'm not sure, they just listed off all their various names and titles, so they might be about to arm wrestle for all I know. She whispered back. No, that's just how nobles behave, it seems the gold one is a prince. Peregrine mentioned. How did Kaz know that? Asked the Oort. It's cause. Unless someone's actively trying to trick him, he seems to be able to tell exactly what someone is with a glance. Andre said with a shrug. Tell me, from where have you come, and why do you come this way? Farron asked. We hail from Hearthfire Abbey and come seeking the ancient fortress of Drake in Feastin. So, the Abbey has been restored. This is tremendous news. As for the mountain though, your search is in vain. That place has been dead for a very long time. You would be better served going back to the Abbey. That is not an option. A great evil has come upon the land, and not even the Abbey will be enough to stand against it. We must restore Drake in Feastin if we are to weather the coming storm. Fell news indeed, but if you seek to escape evil, you should not go to Dry in Feastin. A foulness has seeped into that place. Come with me a little ways and I shall show you. The two remounted, and the party rode after them. They came up one last hill, and they could see a great distance. For the first time in a very long time, they could see the sea, shining silver in the sunlight. They saw a great bay where the rumble down fed into the sea, and a walled city with a port atop a hill besides the bay. That is for road. Farron told him, home of my clan, now look to the north. And to the north they did look, and they saw the great mountain. Drake in Feastin. It stood on the shore, sticking out as though it had grown right out of the seas next to the black sand of the beaches around it. It scraped high into the air, taller than almost any of the barrier mountains further to the south, even though it was a great distance away. But there was no smoke, no shimmer of heat from the volcano's fire. Instead a shadow hung upon the mountain and the land about it. The volcanic soil should have been filled with life. But there was nothing, only dark dirt that seemed to shift slightly as they watched. Drakin feasting is no more, Farron said grimly. Now there is only Drakenuid, for there the great worm lies blighted. It has devoured the fire, just as the blight devoured it so long ago, when they fought upon the slopes of San Jonas. He turned to Gazdor. You say you are a dragon slayer. Can you slay one that is already dead? I am the bard, who has seen the lights that shine in the darkness, and the darkness is unable to overcome them. Within the lands who have borne many names, most of which have been forgotten, but were called the Summer Lands are now Ordania, six new lights, one burning darkly, entered into the last stronghold of the land that was before them. Kazdor Glamdring, Senkit Zaratustra, Julian Turahan, Peregrine Horse Rider, Andre Silverthorn, and the Oort Princeps rode at the head of their caravan towards the city on the hill by the sea, led by her prince, Farron. The city was called for road, and it was built atop a high hill and down its slopes in all directions as far as a natural harbour nestled in a bay. 
The sun was setting as they hurried in, and it seemed to come to rest at the end of the bay, where the land fell away altogether into nothing but silver sea turned golden by the sunset. The city was densely built up on the hill, with most houses at least three stories tall, but also somewhat narrow. They were built of stone and rested upon stone foundations. Many of them were whitewashed as well, so that the city gleamed in the sunlight. There was a great hall built upon the summit of the hill, and it cast its shadow from the pinnacle to the base. All around the city was a high wall, even down to the beaches, where the dragonborn had cleared away the sand and built barriers to keep it shored up. There was a single entryway set into the wall, and it held three gatehouses which held six gates, each further barred by a portcullis. The first pair was covered, and the wall continued over it. There were holes in the roof, to allow boiling oil or other such defenses to be poured down onto any attacker. Between the first and second gatehouse, the entryway bent sharply, to keep battling rams from being brought up. The walls swept back, so that guards could fire on any passing through. This repeated itself for the third gatehouse. Kazdor recognized the technique. It was not one commonly used, for Durin's folk live underground whenever they are able, but it was one used for building settlements above ground. This was a doughy style of building defenses, of manipulating the battlefield to ensure victory at minimal loss of life to the defender. The caravan was ushered in, the Farron had sent ahead a rider to inform them of their coming. As the last wagon rolled in, the gates fell shut behind it. The ships out in the bay and beyond came in, for the sun was falling low in the sky. Yet in spite of the setting sun, the night time was not nearly so dark as one might expect. Lanterns, forged of iron and placed atop tall poles and set into the sides of building where Litka's door could smell the scent of burning fish and whale oil which must have kept the city bright. The streets were clean, and while somewhat narrow, the caravan made it through relatively easily as they wound their way up to the other side of the hill and came upon a large park that had been cleared away. There was not enough room for the caravaneers in the city, but the caravan could remain here in the park, somewhat cramped but not uncomfortably so. In the center of the park was a fountain, with a statue of a golden dragon from whose mouth fresh water flowed. The party had seen similar pumps all around the city, and Farron explained that they drew water up from the nearby river through ancient Marvin pumps. The colonists soon set to work preparing dinner, and soon found themselves aided by a party of whalers who had come in from a successful hunt. Soon whale was being added, and that was the first of the interactions between the two peoples. The Ordaini, as the people under the paladins had begun to call themselves, a trend Julian subtly smiled over as it had been his idea, were fascinated with the dragonborn, having never seen so many of them in one place. The dragonborn in turn had never seen dwarves, elves, or humans for that matter, and so the two came out to meet one another. The meetings went remarkably well. The Feridians were good-natured, friendly, and curious. The Ordaini were somewhat more mixed. The Kobolds were in awe, the humans friendly, the elves aloof, but eventually they joined in. The Dwarves were somewhat suspicious at first, but these people had been friends of the Doi in ages past, and so they lightened somewhat. The Halflings had heard stories of the city from the few who had wandered there, and so were delighted to find that it was really. As for the Goblinoids, that was somewhat more complicated. The Goblins were naturally nervous of anything but large and not able to flame them. The Hobgoblins on the other hand were simply too disciplined and dour to really begin interacting. There was no love lost with the Dragonborn either, as they had met Goblinoids before and fought against them. Eort noted this and sought to break the ice. He sought out Farron and the two began to speak and each found the other quite agreeable. Soon, others, mostly of the Garden Legion began to follow their captain's example. The Dragonborn wanted to understand their former enemies, and the Hobgoblins, while not quite as curious, soon found the Dragonborn to be stalwart and honorable warriors. A certain respect began to develop between the two peoples. But what truly brought everyone together, as they have so many times before, was good food and large amounts of alcoholic beverages. The Dragonborn had a diet quite unlike anything the Ordaini had ever seen before. They were mostly fishermen and whalers, and quite good at it. 
living between the sea and the river, they had access to many freshwater and saltwater fish. However, they did not grow wheat or vegetables, nor did they have cattle or goats for milk and meat. Instead, they had transformed the nearby marshes into a series of rice paddies, and grew that grain there. Furthermore, they cultivated seaweed in the bay, and had that for their greens. This resulted in a sort of food that the Odeni had never seen before. There were rice balls, steamed dumplings, and a certain kind of roll where the Ferradians would wrap raw fish in rice and seaweed, then soak it in vinegar and rice wine, then eat that. It was a new culinary experience for the dragonborn as well. They had never tasted wheat bread, nor beef nor pork. A few of the older ones had vague memories of halfling pies, but now they all became quite accustomed to the wonders of halfling food. They were practically nostalgic over the dwarves' mushroom sauce, and there became something of a competition between them and the elven contingent over who could cook fish the best way. The elven manner of cooking involved light use of any spices or salts, and instead preferred to accentuate the flavor of the fish with herbs and careful preparations. Further bolstering it with light sauces and careful pairings with wines, salads, and breads. The dragonborn way of cooking seafood was perhaps entirely the opposite. They used lighter fish as vessels for other flavors, such as with the aforementioned soaking in vinegar and rice wine. However they also fried it in various other types of oil and rubbed spices and salt into them, or breaded them with rice flour and served them with seaweed chips. For stronger fish like tuna, they would try and grind up the rice into crumbs, then mix it into ground fish and make them into patties to be baked. Where they truly favored their craft was with shellfish and dildo. There their spices, frying, steaming, and boiling brought the flavor of the heartier seafood into the forefront. The end result was the flavor equivalent of getting body checked by Kazdor, a blast of pure umami strong enough to throw someone off their feet. A series of food wars erupted across the park as the elven elegance and precision lanced like rapier and dagger against the greed tax power of the dragonborn's spices and frying. As for alcohol, the dragonborn fermented their rice into a sort of wine. They had also tried thus with seaweed, but the result had been an abomination even a late would flinch at. Several circles began to form where there would be intense arguments between men, elves, dwarves, and dragonborn over the superiority of mead, ale, beer, wine, and sake. These arguments remained good-natured and got progressively more hilarious to watch as the participants continued to sample each other's drinks and get progressively drunker. Another series of incidents that became both hilarious and mildly terrifying far quicker was what happened when the dragonborn got a taste of the goblin's mushroom beer. A six to eight foot tall scaly giant stumbling around high as a kite and tripping harder than a blind man in a banana peel factory is funny and did you remember they are also up to a ton of pure muscle and can breathe fire. Fortunately, a dragonborn settlement is very, very good at dealing with accidental fires. Despite all this camaraderie and contentment, in spite of all the good humor and welcoming spirit, one person was still apart. There was yet one whom the dragonborn would shy away from or deliver harsh glares towards. Kazdor. Surrounded by his own kind, he was still not welcome. The dragonborn of the road were all golden, and they knew the danger and wrath of their crimson cousins. The sons of Bohemut and the sons of Shamat, all grandchildren of Io, so alike in dignity and character, yet so filled with hatred and fear because of the folly of their gods. So, Kazdor spent the evening largely in the company of his friends in order undivided, and also among the dwarves of his clan. It did not disturb him all that greatly, for he was rather used to the fear and the angry stares. He'd had more than enough of those from his brother to get used to them. This continued until the grand potluck was coming to an end, and various songs were being sung. First sung the halflings, a jaunty tune of a hero who stole a magic ruby which could charm the feeble-minded, and how he used it to trick an orc lord into attacking a dragon and being destroyed, along with all his horde. Then sang the humans, a tale of ancient chivalry that was part of a far larger saga even than this one. The tale was of a king who sired many sons, and the war that was between him and his eldest when they turned against each other. 
They sung only a part of the tale, one where one of the sons returns home and finds that in his absence his sons have turned against him, just as he turned against his father. In that song was tragedy, but a just tragedy as the evil of one was turned against him. Then the old San, an ancient love story between a king of winter and a daughter of spring, and how they came to marry. Long they pined for one another, but the queen of spring would not permit it. So, the king of winter stole his love away, and a wily sorceress led the queen all about, here and there and everywhere until it was too late, and the vows between the king and his bride were sworn. Then it came time for the dwarves to sing, Anka's door rose. This generated a great deal of muttering among some, but they were quiet as he spoke. Here is a song long passed down among my people, one that every clan knows, and every stronghold has rung with many times. It is the song of our first king, of the first kingdom, and of the first and greatest grudge, that it was diminished such that none remember where it now lies. I have seen your city, that you were friends to the Doi. This song was no doubt sung here once long ago, and it is high time that it was sung again. And so, Kazdor began to sing. His voice was strong, his diction sturdy, and his resonance mighty. That alone could not have made it what it was though. I am a bard, and so I know a thing or two about music. So truly, truly I say to you that music is the language of the soul. For the world was sung into being, and all things in it are upheld by and contribute to the great song that has creation. Therefore, no matter the tongue, tribe, or nation, music shall ever speak clearly. For it is the soul to the soul, the eternal resonating upon the material. This is why as Gazdor sung, the audience was sent back. They could feel the stones of the first hold under their feet, hear the sound of hammers forging wonders beyond this age's comprehension. They felt a great longing, a great nostalgia, as though for a childhood home they had never set foot in. They felt a great mourning for the diminishment of the world, and as the song came to an end, they felt the hope, the resolve, and the wrath that made the Doi who they were. And they marveled, for they knew, though they would not have the words to express it, that only the soul of a Doi could speak this way. For the soul speaks in music, regardless of what race's throat it may use. There was no more singing after that, for none could hope to match what had been sung. Kazdor sat down, and Senkit put a hand on his shoulder. There were tears in his eyes, and he was looking towards the dark mountain to the north, towards Draken Feastin. But it was not the Draken Fastin that he truly looked, for that mountain was to him only an echo, only a vestige of the true and first hold that was forever beyond his reach. After a little while, Farron gathered the paladins, and said to them, Come, the feast goes well enough. Come and see my father, for he is old, and cannot come down to see you. And so they went up to the great hall at the peak of the hill, and entered in through the great double doors which faced eastwards towards the gates. By now the sun had set altogether, and the only light was it of the lamps, and of the moon which was but a waning crescent. Inside the hall they saw many chairs and benches, two long tables, all of this set around a great fire that burned in the center of the room. On the walls were hung many trophies, some so ancient that they even predated the building, but came from before the clan had come to live in a single place. At the end of the hall there was a high chair set up, and in it sat an ancient dragonborn. He had once been tall and mighty, but now had shrunk somewhat in his old age. His once proud scales were dull, his limbs weak with arthritic pain and the scars of a lifetime of battle. He wore heavy furs, though the night was mild, and drew close to the fire. A walking stick sat by his throne, and his left leg was greatly withered. Still though, his eyes were bright, and the green of the sea was in them. In them was wisdom and discernment to know the will of God in the hearts of men. At his side stood a younger dragon-born woman, perhaps around twenty or so years of age. She stood proudly at attention, a spear in one hand and a shield in the other. She was fair and terrible as a Valkyrie. Her eyes bore the same deep green as her father and brother, but rather than calm wisdom they were the fury of the storm, the eyes of a warrior who has come to love war. The paladins began to bow, but the old dragonborn raised his hand to stop them. Do not bow as door star crowned. I may yet live to see you come into your glory. Kazdor did not answer him, and bowed anyways. 
Angel at our side, and Julian opened his mouth to speak, but the old dragon silenced him. I know why you have come ask alone, more so perhaps than even you do yet. Be still. Your words will shed enough blood in time. You seek the mountain that the scourge may come against the scourge and be victorious. This is wise. But you seek that which you do not understand. All of this has happened before, and all shall happen yet again. Hear now the ancient tales upon which this land is founded. The worm within the forsaken hold is called for road, and it was he who founded our city. He was one of the five great heroes who won this land from the hobgoblins. His companions were Matthias the Tiffling, whom built the great abbey with the blessings of Zepan, Tremaze, first king and builder of Drake in Feastin. Ben Hapsat the elf lord who sang Fi Karen into being, and Jonas the Conqueror, a mortal man mighty of mind and blade, who by wisdom and sorcery cast down the last great city of the hobgoblin empires. To this day it is named San Jonas in his honor. Together they came to this land, when for road was but a wormling. By might and by wisdom they conquered and created the greatest land in the north, for 500 years peace and prosperity ruled the land. Then the blight came, and doom came. It manifested first within the capital, and there slew everyone. The great university could not stop it, nor could the guards, for to even draw near it was death. The only ones who survived were those who hid themselves within the great cathedral, where it could not enter. Now Farod had been away at the time, but as soon as he heard of it he returned with all speed. By now the blight had strode down the great river and had come upon Drake in Feastin. There he saw what had happened and wept, and our forefathers heard his lamentations. Alas! Alas! The light of dawn is gone out, the fires of the mountain have been smothered. The might of dwarven lords is broken. Their line is run out. Their crown is fallen into darkness. Never shall it light again but by the blood of kings and by the dragon fire. Then he descended and there fought the blight, and drove it back into the shadow, but he was mortally wounded. As a last resort, he drew the darkness of the mountain into himself, and perished. Now only a shell possessed by five stirring evil remains. There it waits, until the blood of kings shall come, and the light and dragon fire the mountain once more. All these things have been passed down from chief to prince, from my grandfather's grandfather unto me. For three hundred years we have waited, the last light of the land, whose name has been undone. Waited for the blood of kings to come and light the mountain once more in dragon fire. You will keep waiting then. Cause Dor answered him. There is no king here. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.